Good, and uh, once again, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this webinar called UX responses, uh, Responsiveness and Animations, uh, Making Your Application Come Alive. Our, this is our second webinar together with our uh, Trust GFX partner, Mueller Informatics. Uh, my name is Soren Mikkelsen and I will be your host today. Um, developing an embedded UI and having enough RAM, flash, and a fast microcontroller and the right display is not enough to deliver a superior user experience. Uh, smartphone look and feel is often expected in many embedded devices. Um, and this is also the reason why we are seeing more uh, companies involving uh, user experience designers. Um, at our last webinar, we actually did a poll uh, about who was making the user experience design at your company. And I think we should try out this poll again and see uh, if we get the same result as last time. Um, I will launch it right here. So please put in your vote. Um, meanwhile, uh, I would like to ask you, Henrik, um, you are often saying uh, something to us about who should be doing the UI design. Uh, and maybe you should share this uh, with the audience. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, usually I try not to offend anyone uh, when I say that engineers or developers uh, should not be uh, be doing the UI. Uh, and of course, I say this with a, a lot of respect. Uh, it's the same reason why I should not be, be coding. Uh, people have different areas of expertise and uh, making a, a successful and, and a, a great UI that we really get the best out of your product is not a trivial task, uh, which is why it should often be uh, be, uh, be left to, to someone with at least uh, some knowledge in that area. Great. Thank you, Anai. Uh, I can see that we are actually reaching 90% uh, of you voting, and this is, I would say, uh, really important and great to see for me and Henrik that uh, you are involved and, and ready for this webinar. 54% of uh, of you are doing, uh, is, is software engineers doing the user experience part of it, and only 14% uh, are using UI and UX designers. At our last poll, it was around 22%. Um, it's decreasing. <laughs> Let's see if it changes in the future. Um, good, next slide, please, Henrik. Um, again, uh, like I mentioned before we started the webinar, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and you can ask questions related to trust effects, embedded UIs, uh, hardware selections, uh, different uh, microcontrollers from STM32, or you could ask about the embedded user experience design and uh, the graphics part of it. So please fire away. Um, um, with us today, we have Henrik over here, which uh, will sh sh um, talk more about who he is and where he's from. Uh, but let me give you a short introduction to him. Uh, he's uh, from Mueller Informatics and an embedded uh, UX specialist with uh, extensive knowledge about user experience design on especially embedded devices. And uh, yeah, and he will uh, share more about this. Behind the scenes, uh, we have ready for, uh, for answering questions and so on. We have uh, Jan Mugen from ST Microelectronics, and he's right next to me. And you could say, hey, hello, Jan. And also we have uh, Kim from Mueller Informatics, uh, also involved in embedded uh, UI and UX design. Uh, maybe he's also there. Hi, Kim. Great. Um, after the webinar, uh, we will also launch a survey, which I hope you will participate in and give us some feedback. Um, this is valuable and uh, yeah, great to see if uh, you'll do that. Um, next slide, please, Anna. Great. Uh, again, uh, my name is Soren Mikkelsen and I'm your host today. And with us, we have a UX specialist, Henna. Um to give you a quick introduction uh, and an idea of the company Mjolnir Informatics, uh, I hope you know the framework TouchGFX. Um, and uh, TouchGFX was actually invented in Mjolnir Informatics by some developers. Um, later on, TouchGFX became an independent company um, and having skilled UX and UI designers uh, right next door, TouchGFX and Mjolnir, uh, continue to have a close relationship. And uh, we have done many UI projects together, uh, utilizing their skills in uh, the graphics, uh, designing the graphics part, 
and us doing the implementation. Uh, and I'm sure Henrik will tell you a lot more about this. Um, now that TouchGFX is a part of SG Microelectronics, uh, our focus is now uh, on the accelerated roadmap, uh, adding new features, widgets, and integration with, for example, Cube and CubeMX. This is our priority now. Um, and you will have some more official news about this in, uh, in mid-November. Um, this webinar and all our other webinars is just one uh, of our steps towards providing you with many, uh, the many aspects of developing an embedded UI. And I hope you will enjoy uh, attending this webinar and uh, gain a lot of valuable knowledge from, uh, from Henrik. Uh, and with this, uh, let me just say, um, take it away Henrik and uh, yeah, sit back and re relax. Thank you very much, Saren. Uh, I'll try to to live up to the to the hype. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Henrik. Uh, I'm a user experience designer at Milner Informatics. Uh, as uh, Saren said, uh, one of our projects uh, a, a good handful of years ago actually spawned the idea of uh, of the Touch GFX uh, framework. Uh, I included the the remote we see from Velux in in the right hand corner of your slides, which was actually the uh, the, the the exact project that uh, that spawned uh, the touch gfx adventure that is now in the hands of st and of course uh, it's uh, both with the uh, with sad feelings that we have to let uh, touch gfx go but we're also super happy to see that uh, we can now really accelerate touch gfx in, in, in with a, a bit uh, say bigger muscles than uh, than we have been able to before um I come from a, a company called Mule Informatics. It's a Danish-based uh, IT consultancy. Uh, of course, we do embedded design. Uh, we also do uh, desktop application and apps uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, what we are really passionate about is actually helping our customers grow their business, uh, not just today, but also tomorrow. And the way, the way we do this is having a very close relationship between uh, software developers uh, and designers, so we really get the best of both worlds and combine this into into products. Uh, some other areas uh, of uh, expertise uh, would be uh, data science, data uh, digital transformation, um, Internet of Things, uh, virtual reality. So we have a, a lot of different things going on. Uh, we do all things digital. Uh, and if you still think that uh, I was worth listening to in a small, uh, a little 50 minutes, 50 minutes or so, uh, you're more than welcome to to enter the link after uh, after the webinar, or maybe uh, catch me uh, when I'm rambling on about something and you need to something to look at. You're more than welcome to drop in on the on the link and have a look at what we can do for you. Um, all right, I think that's enough about uh, us, and I'll uh, get straight to to the good stuff then. Um, I just wanted to to sum up what uh, uh, what what's in it for you today. What what would the takeaways be for for for, um, for from the webinar? Uh, of course, uh, being more aware of responsiveness and animations in your UIs and your products will of course give you happier end users. Uh, they will be more impressed with your product. Uh, they will get uh, better feedback when they're using it, and their overall experience will be better. Of course, this will uh, in turn uh, give you higher product success, success rates. Uh, a, a lot of the reason behind a, a successful product is uh, the ability to uh, to get users to accept it. Uh, and user is, uh, of course, uh, more um, open to accepting a, a product that he thinks is good and actually solves uh, whatever issues he's uh, trying to solve. Um, so this uh, this uh, has a very very good relationship with the with the end users' um, expectations to your product. Um, one thing uh, I promised to touch upon as well is uh, that you can actually lower your need for for product support. If you're making a UI and making a product that is very well explained and and may, maybe self-explanatory in a lot of areas, you can actually cut down a lot in in how much you need to support this product afterwards. Not only in manuals, but also if you have any live support or open telephone lines, that you don't need uh, 30 people to support this product if uh, most people. Uh, can uh, find out how it's working on their own and only need to call when it's something is really wrong and don't need to call whenever they cannot find that one setting. Um, so that uh, that is definitely some uh, some something that's worth considering uh, going in this direction as well. 
um, of course, uh, making a, 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 a good UI is also something that it, it requires that you can bridge the gap between your embedded developers and your UI and UX designers and really involve both of these uh, areas of expertise in, in the process. Uh, one thing you can do in TouchGFX to allow this, uh, this synergy and this uh, cooperation is, of course, using the, the TouchGFX designer. Uh, I'll show that off and uh, a little bit of about how I use it uh, very shortly during the presentation as well. So um, we'll have a look at that later. All right, I'll jump into uh, into the agenda if PowerPoint will allow me. Thank you very much. Um, so the agenda today is I have uh, four different chapters that we'll go through. And of course, you'll be able to uh, ask questions along the way. I'll have uh, a few breaks and uh, Saren will pick out the, the best questions that you might have. So keep them coming. Um, the chapters that we're going uh, through today is, uh, first of all, uh, how do you create a responsive UI? Uh, what is the basics? What is the, the thought behind creating uh, something as responsive and talks back to the user? Um, afterwards, I'll, I'll touch a bit about the importance of feedback, about, about why we are actually doing this uh, and wh why, we, uh, why we cannot uh, dismiss it as something that is uh, nice to have, for example. Um, then uh, I included uh, some, uh, some some chapter about animations in TouchGFX and how you can approach this. Um, of course, making uh, animations on embedded devices uh, and especially with uh, with TouchGFX um, is something that uh, requires a, a bit of know-how uh, if you are coming from a desktop or app development world, because in in those uh, in those worlds you have all the horsepower you could ever dream of. When you're going to uh, microprocessors and embedded devices in general, you really need to mind uh, what you what you spend your time on and how, how much horsepower you're using. And TouchGFX provides a lot of tips and tricks uh, on how to approach this. And I want to touch upon, upon just a few of them today. Last but not least, we have uh, animation speed. Uh, how much, uh, how how uh, slow is too slow, and how fast in general should you should you be uh, with your animations? I put together a few guidelines, and these are of course are, are only guidelines. So um, we'll touch about them, uh, touch upon them in a, in a few uh, few minutes. Um, I included a lot of animation examples as we go, so hopefully you won't, won't get too bored at home. Um, so uh, I'll stop talking about the agenda as well and jump into the first chapter. All right, so the first chapter today is uh, creating a responsive UI and how you actually go about uh, doing this. What should the thought process be? Um, and one thing I really like uh, to, uh, how I really like to explain it is actually um, that you want to apply physical domain knowledge to the digital embedded domain. This sounds super fancy, but what we actually want to do is apply the knowledge that uh, people already have from the physical world and use that same philosophy in the digital world. Um, one very simple example is um, uh, how you interact with the door. Uh, I don't know about uh, your end of the world, but in Denmark, doors usually have doorknobs. Uh, and a doorknob is, is something that really sets apart, sets, uh, is set apart from, from the rest of the door. So it's very easy to recognize how you operate that door. How do you open it? And how do I go through this? How do I get into this room? And that is the exact same philosophy we want to apply in the, in the digital world. We want uh, buttons or things that people can interact with to stand out and be inviting for the user because the user wants to know where he can interact. He doesn't want to, to actually have to ask that question. He, he wants to find out for himself. And you can really uh, create a responsive uh, UI by, by guiding him in this way. Of course, users also also expect to be delighted with the visual effects uh, as they interact with the screen. Um, and this is something that we see a lot, uh, especially uh, as uh, newer smartphones are, are released to the market. People always expect the same uh, performance, the same smoothness, and the same nice animations as they're used to on the smartphones. So it's very important to meet those expectations because as soon as you don't, uh, people will think less of your product. Um, of course, uh, users always also need to understand the context of the system as they navigate it. Um, 
this is actually super important for uh, for users to be able to to recognize uh, what menu did I come from and what menu will I enter if I press this button, because this this uh, creates a, a mental map of the application as they are navigating it, uh, and this is really important for understanding the possibilities they have with the application or the product that that you are using. So. I tried to narrow down uh, three areas uh, that you can focus on uh, when trying to make a UI feel responsive. Uh, the first one is, of course, responsiveness. And this is what uh, what signals to, to users that buttons are clickable, um, that they are uh, open for interaction. The other one is uh, is engagement, and these uh, uh, touches a bit more about the uh, the visual effect um, that you can uh, you can uh, add to your application because you want to engage the user and invite the user for um, for interactions and and not just be uh, have a passive UI that doesn't really uh, invite for anything. It gets uh, very plain and it gets very boring. So you need some kind of um, engagement in your UI design to actually uh, invite the user in and, and tell him that he can in, interact uh, in different areas. And the last one is uh, activity. And I have an example for this to explain this one as well. Because um, activity is the visual changes that indicate that the underlying system is changing at the moment. Um, so you usually don't want to do animations just for the sake of animations. Of course, animations are cool and all, but you want them to have a purpose. And one purpose you can have with animations uh, is uh, is the road, uh, is the um, example that I want to to mention here. Um, the iPhone, uh, when it, uh, when the iPhone originally came out, uh, you can uh, and you can still do, do this today. You can rotate your phone from a portrait mode to a landscape mode, and whenever you did this on on the original iPhone, uh, you would have a, a rotating animation that actually uh, turns the screen visibly for the user, so the user can follow that. Uh, when he goes from portrait mode to landscape mode, he can see how his uh, different apps or different content on the screen is rearranging. Um, and this actually helps him uh, understand this uh, this new um, orientation of the phone, whereas uh, Android UIs did not have this until the 4.1 update, the ice cream sandwich update. Uh, before that, the screen would just, uh, would just uh, snap um, right away. Uh, leaving no uh, animation to the user. Uh, and this was ex extremely frustrating for a lot of people. It was so frustrating that people downloaded third-party apps to be able to have this animation. Uh, and it, this really shows how important these animations are to actually help the user understand what system is behind and how this uh, how the system uh, works. So this is the, the background uh, for, for how we create a responsive UI. Before I go into my next chapter, I'll allow uh, Sean to uh, to ask a question. He seems uh, very eager. <laughs> Thank you, Hanek. Uh, yes, we have a question from the audience about this topic you, you just uh, uncovered. Uh, do I need uh, to have fancy graphics and animations for making sure the user gets feedback? Uh, not at all. The um, the uh, philosophy of giving feedback uh, it basically has nothing to do with uh, with fancy graphics. Um, but of course, ha having grand uh, having fancy graphics or at least uh, graphics that matches your product uh, it has a lot of other benefits. Um, but the the feedback itself it can come from something as silly as uh, something as simple as just changing the color of of a button whenever it is pressed down. So you tell the user that I have registered your action uh, and uh, it, it will mean something. Um, and, and it can be something as simple as just changing a hex code. It doesn't have to be fancy at all. OK, thank you. And once again, I will encourage, encourage the attendees to, uh, to ask questions. Uh, please use the, the question area and the go to webinar setup. Um, keep them coming. Uh, we'll try to answer them all. All right, I will keep on going as you uh, as you get to type in your questions. So, chapter two: the importance of feedback. Um, for this uh, this uh, chapter, of course, we need to touch about upon why is it so important to deliver this feedback. Um, 
And first of all, uh, maybe the, the one single reason, if that's all you're going to take away from this, is that you need to acknowledge the, the user whenever he makes an action. And this counts for every single action. Um, we are all, uh, when it comes to, uh, to digital systems and, and UIs in general, we are all very impatient people. Um, whenever we touch a button, we do not wait around for 10 seconds to see if something's going to happen. We touch that button and if nothing has happened instantly, we will touch it again or we'll touch somewhere else. So it's really, really important to constantly acknowledge that the user's uh, actions matter to the to the UI. Otherwise, you, uh, the, the user will uh, start to think, what, was the action successful? Do I have to wait? Uh, did the system actually catch that button press or uh, was it uh, busy with something else? Maybe it ignored it. Um, so uh, there's a lot of questions that arises and they arise very, very quickly. Um, one thing, uh, if we if we want to um, to uh, to put this into a few categories, uh, we can say that uh, appropriate use of uh, feedback is vital for good UI design. But you also need to um, to balance what kind of feedback you're providing. Um, so for frequent or minor actions, uh, you can uh, you can present a modest feedback, and this could of of course be. Uh, button states or gray out uh, unavailable features uh, and then for for rare or major actions you need something that is a bit more substantial you need to tell the user that you you press something here that is uh, important or it, this uh, this starts a progress that will not finish right away uh, so you need some kind of indication that uh, that this is going on and i think uh, soren will help me uh, show a few examples here um and from a design perspective, it can really be argued that uh, giving appropriate use of feedback is probably the most basic guideline for, for providing a, a user interface uh, that is uh, usable for, for users. It's, it's such, a, such a basic thing. Um, all right, so the first one uh, I want to show uh, is uh, the, um, let me see here. Uh, I want to show you a few button press examples. So this is uh, could be for for frequent or minor actions. So in this app, we have some uh, some sort of home control demo, uh, and I'm able to to press a button here, and it actually lights up with a with a nice blue color. And I'll slide off my finger so we don't actually enter the menu, uh, but it, I can instantly see that the the application is registering my uh, my finger press, um, and I'm, I'm acknowledged for what I'm trying to. Uh, to say to the interface or what I'm trying to do to it. And this gives me a, a nice and cozy, warm feeling inside. Um, another thing uh, you could uh, do, for example, this is uh, some blinds control for, for this house. Uh, it's a bit far away, but I think this is a children's room. Uh, so when I select that uh, single room, I'm able to uh, to control the, the blind levels in this room uh, alone. But what the UI does here as well is actually uh, gray out all other areas or all other rooms in uh, in my house, and this tells me that all right, I I uh, pressed uh, on this uh, this uh, children's room control, uh, and now I'm focusing on controlling this. I don't want to see a lot of other options and uh, other things I can do with the app because I chose to focus on one, this one single thing. And again these small UI animations can really help the user uh, to be guided and to be focused on the exact job that he needs to do. Um, the other example I have is uh, for rare or uh, major action, for example. I, I, um, I use the uh, the progress indicator example that if you need to, to, to start something, in this case, uh, this is uh, will be a, a scan of some sort. So if we are scanning something, it might take a, take a while. Uh, in this case, it will be a bit uh, TV kitchen style and don't take uh, more than a few seconds. Um, but if I start this uh, this scan, I, I, ha I actually have a slight uh, button press animations here as well. But when I start the scan, I get some progress indication that you started something, it will take uh, one or two seconds to finish. And again, this gives me a feeling that I'm instantly acknowledged that I started something. I can see that the, the UI is working uh, to prepare something, uh, some result for me. 
Um, and I'm uh, I'm actually quite a uh, believer and I'm a quite patient person when I can see that uh, that uh, it's uh, it's on its way. The result will be there in a second. Um, so this is uh, um, examples of uh, how you can approach these different uh, different um, user feedback, uh, say. Uh, Use of, uh, use of appropriate use of feedback for, for different actions, whether they're minor or major. So the next slide um, for, for this chapter is, uh, of course, the feedback speed. Um, and the, the reason why you want to provide immediate feedback uh, to the user is because immediate feedback um, teaches um, the the underlying cause and effect relationship that uh, the user will have with the application. Um, if the user is acknowledged immediately, he will very, very quickly realize that if I press this button, I go to a new screen. Or I adjust this slider, my volume changes, my brightness changes. It's very, very uh, easy for him to figure out uh, what consequences, what effects his actions uh, uh, had. Um, of course, um, some uh, some people have done research on on how slow, too sl uh, how much uh, you can wait to deliver this feedback. Um, I included a, a, a source in in uh, my notes for the slideshow, so you'll be able to check that out afterwards. But the research shows that even 100 milliseconds is noticeable uh, for users, and this will annoy them. It will feel sluggish. It will feel slow. That whenever they do something, it just takes uh, just a tenth of a second to to respond, and this is a, a, a super annoying, um, a super annoying uh, feeling to have. Um, of course, when you provide uh, feedback, if if this feedback is delayed, if there's uh, some hang up in in the feedback that you're giving to the the user, this actually uh, starts to diffuse uh, this cause and relate, re cause and effect relationship that the user uh, wants to have with the application, and suddenly the user is not very sure of um, why. Uh, why something has happened when you touch the interface. If he presses a button and something happens happens five seconds after, he's not sure if it was the cause of the button press or if something just timed out. And it starts to really confuse that relationship a lot. Um, as one one example to to explain this, uh, and again I'll, I'll use an example from the physical world because the physical and the digital world uh, can uh, control can uh, learn a lot from each other, um, at least in in the way that we want to uh, design something in, in the digital world. Um, so if you're walking into a, a hotel and you're standing in in the reception or the hotel lobby, uh, and you go up and and, and want to check in. If uh, if you see that there's someone behind the counter, uh, but they do not acknowledge that you're standing there, then they do not acknowledge that you're ringing the bell and asking for someone. Uh, you don't need to do that for a lot of, uh, for uh, for a long time before you start to get really really annoyed with it. So it's very basic for us humans that we want to be acknowledged for whatever we do in the world. We want the world to respond to our actions. And it's the exact same way in, in, in the digital world. All right, third chapter. CERN, have any questions? Uh, yes, but before we dig into that, uh, I think it is worth mentioning that the examples which Henrik is showing on the, the different boards is uh, available in the Tusty FX Designer, which 60% of you is going to download after the webinar. So uh, you can find them in there. Um, and if you have a a board, a discovery board, an STM32F769 or an F746 discovery board. This is what we have over here. Uh, you can actually flash the boards immediately and see uh, the graphics working um, and test the different, ex uh, different examples we have. Um, one question we have, Henrik, is uh, what is the best way to test if my UI is responsive enough uh, and before we take up that question, I think we should launch a poll uh, and also to see if you are still alive out there. And I will launch it right now and you can uh, take over. All right, so uh, while you're asking the, the poll, I'll, uh, I'll answer the question. Um, what is the best way to figure out if uh, you have appropriate feedback in, in your application? And the best way to do this is put it in front of someone get someone to use it and it doesn't have to be uh, very fancy with a uh, 
a, a test audience and 20 people that you don't know and that are in the exact exact uh, target group for the uh, the product it might as well just be putting it in front of a colleague you have uh, find someone who hasn't been on the project and get them to to mess around with the application for a bit it can really be done uh, quick and dirty in that way and it will give you some feedback that i promise you you didn't think that you would get you always get surprised uh, by what people have to say about the work that you've put in and it's much better to realize this early in the process than actually doing this after maybe a couple of hundred a couple of thousand hours of work and you figure out something very basic is wrong uh, so we really want to um, to fail fast uh, in that regard uh, so you can you can start to recover and correct anything that you you might need to do in in your application Great, thank you. Uh, I'll close the poll now, and uh, I can see you are awake out there and share it. Um, where does the first idea for a new version or, or of a product or a new product start? Uh, and I can see this really spread out to many departments, and I think this is also the case for for us here that uh, new ideas can come from everywhere. Um, uh, yeah, so. So I think it's much like the same as, as us. Uh, I will hide this again. And um, yes, please continue, Henrik. Thank you very much. All right, chapter three, um, animations in touch to Um So I said that they are uh, doing uh, embedded uh, or doing animations on embedded devices is a bit different, uh, especially if you're used to, uh, to making uh, stuff in a web browser or, or uh, mobile phone apps. Um, because you need to be wary of your your horsepower here. Um, if you start to uh, to put your uh, your microprocessor to at least too much work, it will start to to lag. You'll uh, get too high an MCU load. Your FPS will drop, uh, and it it will really get uh, give a, a bad stuttering experience for for your users. So you need to be uh, very aware of how many resources you resources you're using every single time, and Fortunately, uh, TouchGFX comes with a lot of widgets and, and transi transitions uh, that you can use um, out of the box and you can customize them uh, as you want to. Uh, but it gives you a, a, a quite a large tool set to actually go about and creating a good UI uh, without being a graphics expert at all. This is, of course, one of the two uh, approaches I want to, to talk about uh, today because if, uh, if you uh, do not um, at least do, do not solely want to uh, uh, to rest on the, uh, the the things that TouchGFX can do for you uh, already. You can of course also start to think in fully customizable uh, animations that can really set you apart from uh, from the comp competition. Um, I'll first run through uh, the 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 first approach um, that what you can get out of the, of TouchGFX and what TouchGFX already uh, does quite well. Um, so of course, there's a lot of widgets, a lot of uh, tools that we could talk about here. I picked uh, some of my personal favorites. Uh, I think uh, Soren will uh, help me demonstrate one of them as well. So the first one is is the carousel menu. And uh, the carousel menu is something that we see a lot of in, uh, in embedded devices, because usually you're working on, a, on very small displays. So you, we want to... Uh, to put a lot of information, a lot of different uh, menu options into a, a very small amount of screen space. Uh, and this is what the carousel allows us to do. Um, one thing, of course, uh, the carousel does in TouchGFX is, of course, actually having the, the menu uh, item in front to be a little bit larger than the ones in the back. Um, and this is, uh, this is done by, by actually, actually scaling the image. Uh, and this is usually a, a big no-no on embedded devices. Uh, TouchGFX and low resource hardware in general is great at drawing images one-to-one. Uh, -one. But as soon as you start to decrease or increase the size of an image uh, and you let the, the processor do those calculations, you really start to hog up a lot of resources that could be used on different stuff. Um, but the, the, the carousel uh, widget in TouchGFX is a great example about how some of these widgets uh, that are already optimized and have a lot of uh, 100 hours of work behind them um, can actually uh, provide you with animations that usually uh, is not uh, meant uh, to be run on uh, on embedded hardware, and especially not microprocessors. Uh, so that's the, the carousel uh, menu for you. Um, the other one I've, uh, I want to highlight is, of course, uh, transitions. 
and this is, has a lot to do with the the activity point I, I talked about before about how users should understand the system that is uh, that is behind uh, behind the screen, uh, so the user can can start to get an idea of how do I navigate this, how do I get from one screen to another, um, and and really create that mental map of what the possibilities uh, would be in the application. And to do this, uh, I'm uh, jumping into this time and calendar um, setup menu. Um, see if I can get in. Yep. So um, for this uh, this uh, small uh, setup screen, uh, these small uh, setup screens, we're actually setting up the the date and the time uh, for the application. And one thing that I want you to to notice is that in the bottom you actually uh, have three dots, and the the leftmost uh, dot is right now highlighted. Uh, most of you will probably recognize uh, what this is, uh, and that's definitely a good thing. Uh, of course, this indicates that uh, you are currently on uh, a progress to completing something, and it will probably take three steps as indicated in the bottom. So if I choose another uh, clock face here and I jump to the next screen, of course, the middle dot will now be highlighted. Uh, but what also happened is that we have a sideways uh, screen transition. And this helps me understand that, all right, I'm coming from the left, left side. I'm moving to the right side in the reading direction, which uh, at least in, in, in the Western part of the world is the reading direction. Um, is something that uh, that really helps us understand what what is going on underneath. So I could set up the, the time, probably won't spend a lot of uh, effort on doing this now, but I'll press the next button again. Yes, uh, and I'll go to the to the last screen where I can uh, choose a, a month and a date and, and a year. Um, and again, just these simple slide transitions that are already in TouchGFX helps tremendously uh, for me as a user to understand uh, what flow am I looking into, how many screens will there be in this flow, uh, and how uh, where what screen did I uh, come from, and what screen is in front of me, what screen will I enter uh, the next time. And this helps uh, a lot. Uh, for the users to understand uh, how the system will work. Um, all right, so the uh, the other approach to animations, of course, is the one I mentioned. You can go co fully customizable uh, with your animations. This is something we often see uh, with customers if they have, re have requests for uh, custom logo animations uh, or animations that are completely unique and really want to set apart from the competition or maybe uh, set you apart from previous product uh, lines you have in your company. Sometimes uh, when you're launching a new technology or something that is uh, radically different than what you have done before, you really want that fresh look uh, and you really want that step up in, in uh, not only uh, the underlying system but you all also want to step up in your UI and give, give that uh, new and uh, modern look to, to whatever you're trying to achieve. And of course, uh, doing custom animations uh, is usually uh, something we do in TouchGFX with uh, uh, basically uh, frames. So the, it's, it, it can uh, in the in the slide here. I have a, a series of images. Uh, I have 11 Im images of of some water splashing around, and it could be very very simple as this. Um, it doesn't. Uh, I know that uh, fully customizable animations. It sounds expensive and it sounds like a lot of effort, but it can actually be. Uh, you can actually achieve a very, very nice um, experience with very, very little, little effort. And I'll try to, to, uh, to show you this in, in a very simple example here. So, of course, uh, when you want to include a lot of images in an animation, uh, you need to consider your memory usage, which is also one of the constraints of, of low resource hardware. Um, so usually our approach to doing this uh, in uh, in applications is not to go all out and make everything custom. Uh, we'll usually have a blend of something that TouchGFX does already, and then uh, add some uh, some very nice uh, touches here and there with with custom animations. Uh, again, uh, making sure that uh, that the hardware um, requirements and hardware restraints that we have uh, is something that we can live up to. So with uh, with this. Uh, this example, I'll jump into the TouchGFX designer and hope you can see it. Um, right now, I'll launch the the simulator and it should be ready in a second. It comes on my second screen. 
Um, all right, so in, uh, in this example, we, uh, we set up uh, an animated image. Maybe I'll just go back and show you. Uh, so I set up, uh, first of all, a box. It's just a plain white box, so we have a background uh, for our application. And then I put it an animated image widget uh, where I loaded in uh, the, the images um, from before. Uh, you saw on, on the slideshow. So it's just these uh, 11, uh, 11 different images that we are running in, in a sequence. Uh, of course, I chose to loop the animation so we don't get a sudden hold. And then I tweak the, the update interval between each image a bit uh, to get the, the nice feel because here I wanted the, the water to look like it's splashing around in, for example, a washing machine. So when I run the simulator, I'm just running a series of Im images. It's nothing uh, more complex than a, a very simple cartoon. So the water is splashing around. Uh, and again, you can actually achieve something that looks amazing, but with very, very little effort. So going fully customizable with animations is definitely so not something that should scare you off. Um, if someone were to ask what tools we use to make these images, uh, I would say uh, Photoshop or After Effects. So of course, these are more design heavy tools, uh, but I'm, not, I'm sure most of you are not uh, completely strangers to these kinds of applications. All right, I'll jump into the... Uh, we have uh, one question from the audience, and like, while you are at the TouchFX designer, um, let me see, uh, do you have a technical background at first, Enrique? Um No, uh, that's a very short answer. Of course, uh, I've ru been rubbing shoulders with a lot of the TouchGFX uh, guys, but it, uh, it never really made me an engineer. Uh, I haven't studied um, computer science uh, at the university, so I'm, I'm a very, let's say, a soft going guy. I know a lot about users and I know a lot about the, the thoughts behind a good UI, but uh, coding is definitely not my strong suit and I wouldn't recommend anyone to, to get me to code something for them. Um, okay. So definitely not an engineer. Okay, and the last part of this question's, uh, question, uh, and are you using the TouchGFX designer in your daily work? Uh, yes, uh, I'm actually using it a lot when working uh, working with developers because uh, I feel like before the the TouchGFX uh, designer came along, uh, TouchGFX and these embedded frameworks in general were, were very hard to approach for a non-techie person. Uh, and at least from my point of view, you need non-techie persons to create a, a, a great product. Um, so that uh, constraint on the process that you couldn't really truly involve uh, your UI designers or your UX designers in creating those products it was really uh, it was really uh, hard to to get something uh, out of the let's say out of your hands that that really felt like a, a well-rounded uh, product but the touch effects design it actually allows someone like me to to enter that conversation and enter that process where the the developer is uh, already f feels at home um, in the TouchGFX uh, framework, and now I get to to be more involved with it. I can really show him what I want to do and and what approach we should we should go on on separate screens. Uh, and I feel like this is a, d definitely a tool that increases that uh, uh, it, that invites more more different uh, backgrounds into the process. All right, I'll go on. Uh, Saren is waving at me, so that's probably uh, means I should go on. Um, all right, so the last one, uh, I, last uh, chapter I want to talk about today is uh, animation speed. And these, of course, uh, just to give you a few guidelines if this is the, the your first approach to animations. Um, and what I want to uh, underline here is uh, please keep your animations short and sweet. Um, I've seen a lot of examples of uh, people going crazy with the animations and being so proud that oh, everyone should see this animation. So I'll slow it down a bit to, to make sure that everyone saw it. Uh, and of course, animations can, can look great, but as I said before, they should have a purpose. Um, one, uh, one, one example is if you are standing uh, at a, uh, in a train station and you try to buy a train ticket for, for this uh, very modern um, looking uh, ticket machine, um, 
you do really do not want to to watch a lot of animations finishing before you get your ticket. You just want something that is fast and efficient and lets you do uh, what you gotta do uh, with whatever application you're operating. Um, so please keep the animation short and sweet and do not let the animations uh, get in the way of, of the user or get in the way of, of any other process that the, the product is trying to, to complete. With that said, uh, of course, animations is a great way to actually uh, lift off your, uh, your application and give it uh, that, extra, uh, that extra feeling uh, of, uh, of greatness that will set you apart uh, from the competition. Um, so uh, I touched about uh, before on the what I call frequent or minor actions on rare and major actions. Uh, so if we take the frequent or minor actions, you really want to provide that instant feedback. Um, I showed you a study that said uh, 100 milliseconds was too long. So here I would really recommend that if you cannot deliver instant feedback or deliver something that is responding in 20 milliseconds, uh, you really shouldn't go about 50 or 80 milliseconds. And this maybe is a is a bit too generous actually, um, but this is definitely uh, the guideline for all these frequent actions, all these minor actions that happens all the time. You really don't want a small cartoon playing every single time. Uh, for rare and major actions, you can, of course, uh, uh, spend a bit more time on it. Uh, but what is really uh, important to consider here is why is this a major action? Um, some of the products that I've been working on uh, is, of course, not only a GUI product, but it's talking to, to other sets of uh, hardware that need to finish something. Are you doing a calculation? Are you scanning something? Uh, if, the, if the product needs more time, um, the UI can can really help entertain the user and get him to be patient just for a bit longer than if nothing happened at all. Um, so uh, for the for these actions again, you shouldn't consider too too uh, too much uh, delay, uh, but you should scale the uh, the the amount or the speed of the feedback to whatever your your process behind the UI actually needs. Uh, but I would say three or four hundred milliseconds uh, starts to to become an issue, and this is where you need to consider some kind of progress indication for the user. Otherwise, the user will uh, will think that uh, that nothing was registered because uh, he he asked for something to be calculated and he didn't get an instant result. So you need to tell him that the result will be there shortly. Uh, when it comes to screen transitions, you get a bit more time than than uh, than instant, uh, frequent or minor actions. Even though uh, changing the screen might might be something you do a lot, uh, because when you change the screen, the user needs to reorientate himself uh, on the new screen again. Even though it's a screen he's seen before, he just needs to be uh, he he needs uh, just a few. Uh, uh, a tenth of a second to, to actually understand what is going on. Um, so for screen transitions, you can spend a bit more time, but not more than 250, maybe 300 milliseconds, uh, because if you start to do that, the UI will start to feel slow or sluggish, and there's definitely not the, uh, the uh, effect that you want to do. So uh, again, if you're starting to including animations in your products, you really uh, want them to complement uh, whatever action the user is doing and not only have animations for the animation's sake. All right, I think that's uh, it for me. I'll uh, go to... <coughs> Great, and I can thank you. Um, just one question I think we should take up from the audience. We are seeing a lot of questions uh, related to ChargeGFX, and I think we should take one up now. Um, can we make custom widget along with skin effect in ChargeGFX in short period of time? Uh, yes, you can uh, add custom widgets uh, to the ChargeGFX designer. Uh, the ChargeGFX designer itself comes with a lot of widgets, and our new release, the 4.10, uh, hopefully in uh, mid-November, uh, we'll have uh, around 10 new widgets um, and we will continue adding more of these. But you can add custom widgets and in the chat I have actually sent you a link uh, regarding uh, adding a custom widget. Um, the, in the Touch Effects Designer we have added some uh, custom, some skins, uh, button skins and so on. You can of course add your own uh, graphics and or change the already added uh, 
buttons, ex button examples with another uh, color or, or what you want. I hope this answers the question. Um, great, I'm uh, seeing the next slide. Uh, please continue with the questions. Um, we are ready to answer you uh, also after the webinar. Uh, we will are still live, so uh, keep them coming. And uh, if we haven't answered right away, please be patient and maybe wait a few a few minutes. Uh, we have some upcoming webinars. Um, the first of all, we have an uh, upcoming webinar with EDT, uh, a display partner uh, addressing the embedded uh, dis uh, smart embedded display modules. Um, we have not decided a date yet, but it it will be this year. Uh, also, together with uh, Henrik again, uh, we will do another uh, user experience design webinar uh, addressing another topic which we have not decided yet. So, if you have a, an idea or a topic you think is uh, relevant, uh, we should um, discover, please uh, let us know. You can uh, just uh, type in, in the question area and, uh, and, and share it with us. Uh, also, uh, we have an upcoming webinar about TouchDFX 4.10. Uh, this will be about the new widgets and features in TouchDFX and a general introduction. Um, and at last but not least, uh, we have uh, SD will provide you with a webinar uh, about TouchDFX. Uh, so if you have not got an introduction to TouchDFX, this will be a good idea, a, a good way to get it. Uh, we will send you a link in the chat area where you can see uh, where to sign up for this webinar. It is, it's on October 4th, uh, so it's soon, uh, and I hope to, to see a lot of you there. Um, again, uh, visit TouchDFX to download the designer, play with it, uh, flash some boards, and uh, see how easy and fast you can have a, a live UI running. Um, and I will encourage, encourage you to visit the, the Mjolnir website also to learn more about their services. Uh, we have used, used them a lot and are, are really pleased with the results. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, while addressing this, I will just launch a poll to see if you're still there. And uh, what, do you, uh, what do you currently see as the biggest challenge within your company? Uh, please put in your vote uh, and, and we will get some feedback. Um, again, I will uh, note for you that the presentation and the recording will be shared with you after the webinar. Um, this is also available on YouTube and uh, our website. Uh, so, uh, And if uh, you cannot uh, find them, uh, just let me know and I will share them with you. I will close the poll now and share it with you. Um, 43% is implementing the UI onto the hardware. Um, if this is uh, for some, if this is related to the porting part, uh, uh, we actually have a webinar w which is about um, um, our hardware integration, also getting the UI on the board. Um, and we will do more about this. Uh, please visit touchtheeffect.com and you can see previous webinars. I'll close this one. Um, Great. Uh, if you have any questions after this webinar, need information or about embedded UI, uh, please visit, uh, write us or visit our website. You can see our email information here. Um, uh, yes, uh, and please next slide. Um, I would say again, uh, thank you for attending and uh, we here at ST and together with uh, Mjolnir and other partners uh, will in the future provide you with more information and more webinars, uh, and workshops, seminars and so on uh, under the umbrella of embedded UIs. And this is of course to help you uh, achieve a successful embedded uh, project uh, and, and have success in launching your product. Uh, I hope to see you again uh, another time and uh, uh, and just uh, a last comment, uh, I can see actually our our partner and also a Mjolnir partner in the U.S. as we have a lot of the audience in, from the U.S. right now. Uh, he is online, uh, he is from MPROC and uh, this is also a place to go if you need information about Mjolnir services, uh, design services, UX services and so on. Um, so, and I think we can put a link in the, in the chat area. Um, yeah. And again, if we have not answered your questions uh, or your question right away, please uh, wait and we will make sure to do so. Do you have any last comment, Henrik, uh, before we uh, say goodbye? 
Uh, not other than uh, thank you for tuning in, guys. It was a pleasure as always. I hope to see you next time, and uh, thank you, uh, TouchGFX, for having me. You are very welcome, um, and it was on. Uh, it was our pleasure having you, Renek. Uh, I hope you uh, learned a lot, and uh, and we will see you next time. And uh, good evening here from Denmark, and uh, probably good morning to a lot of you. Um, I hope you will have a, a good day. Bye bye.